Hello, hello, and good morning to you. Uh, this is a video about the internet. Uh, it's going to be about its evolution from infancy all the way up to uh, how we're going to dominate it. Now, I consider this to be probably the most transformative uh, technology of our time, the internet that is. It came from humble beginnings as a tool of communication between governments and academics to become the vast network that connects billions of people and devices. It has revolutionized the way that we work, uh, that we live, and how we actually interact. So where did it come from? Well, the invention of the telegraph, telephone, radio, and computer set the stage for an integration of worldwide broadcasting capability that we know as the internet. Its purpose was to serve as a tool for collaboration, for interaction, if you will, between people and their computers, no matter where they were on the planet. Uh, its relatively brief history, though, revolves around four distinct aspects of it. Uh, its technological evolution, its operations and management, its social aspect, and its commercialization. And these have provided us with a readily available information infrastructure. And the initial prototype um, back in the day was called either national or global information structure, uh, infrastructure rather. And it all started with early research in packet switching, which is a method of sending data in small packages, packets. Uh, that started in the 1960s. Uh, we had visionaries like uh, Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn that pioneered the uh, concept of a global interconnected network, right? Interconnected, inter-network, net, internet, that's how it started. And it began with ARPANET, the Advanced Research Network, uh, or the Advanced Research Projects Agency Network. <laughs> ARPANET was the first wide area network and one of the very first computer networks that implemented uh, internet and transmission control protocols. Uh, we, we probably know those better as IP and TCP. And these were done so that the devices could communicate and exchange uh, data with one another. Now ARPANET was originally uh, in four separate locations. The University of California, Los Angeles, the University of California, Santa Barbara, uh, Stanford Research uh, Center, or uh, Research Institute, rather, uh, which was in also in California, and the uh, University of Utah. And ever since then, governments, industry, and academia have been working hard to evolve and deploy the internet technologies as they become available. So not only was ARPANET a forerunner to the internet, it was actually the internet's backbone during development. And though we use the terms internet and WWW, you know, interchangeably, they're really not the same thing. Now the internet is a global network of interconnected computers and servers that communicate with each other using standardized protocols i.e. TCP and IP, right, for the exchange of information, data, and for, you know, communicating between the devices. The World Wide Web, on the other hand, is a system of interlinked hypertext documents accessed via the Internet. It uses a different protocol, and we know that uh, protocol as hypertext transfer protocol otherwise known as HTTP, right? And it uses it to transmit data and display web pages in a browser. Now, the World Wide Web is primarily used for sharing and accessing information in the form of web pages, websites, you know, and online applications. To make this a little simpler, uh, the internet is the infrastructure that connects devices and enables communication. The World Wide Web is a service that uses the internet to share and access information in the form of web pages and websites. So, though the internet has been around since the late 60s, the World Wide Web was actually invited by a British computer scientist, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, back in 1989. 
This made it easy, right? The World Wide Web made it easy for people to access and share information using web browsers. And the first web browser was also created by Tim Berners-Lee and was actually named the World Wide Web. Imagine that. Now later it was renamed Nexus uh, and it was just a simple browser that could display images, HTML documents, and other media on the web. It was um, created in 1990 by uh, Mr. Lee. The Mosaic browser was a web browser that was developed at the University of Illinois in 1992. Uh, programmer Mark Anderson released it in 1993. And it was the first browser to have a graphical user interface, a GUI, and to display both text and images on a single page. Hot stuff, right? Now, following all these things, as you would expect, we had the first uh, website launched and hosted on a uh, on an NEXT computer at CERN. The NEXT computer system was a high-end workstation computer developed and marketed by the NEXT Incorporated, you know, the company um, from 1988 to 1990. And following that, we started to see online communities and forums pop up like Usenet and uh, bulletin board uh, systems. Now, further evolution put tech leaders at the forefront, right? First internet models uh, were actually portal sites uh, in the 1990s. Um, a red square was a hallmark of portals. Most portals had them. Yahoo was the first site to have a directory of manually curated websites organized in a hierarchy, if you will, uh, in order of importance, right? Rather than a searchable index of pages. Now, when we say manually curated, we're just saying that it describes something that's been chosen and selected by a person rather than a computer program. And it was the first site to include news, sports, and financial uh, feeds. Now, Lycos was also uh, one of the first search and navigation sites designed to help people find information more easily and quickly on the World Wide Web. It was created in 1994 by a guy named Michael uh, Moldeen. Uh, that was from the uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon University. It was the first of its kind to use or incorporate relevance retrieval, right? Uh, prefix matching and word proximity. Um, I guess that became, you know, the word processor. We're talking about keywords here. Um, it also operated one of the web's earliest crawler-based search engines. So that's kind of cool. Now, Netscape came along and it was considered to be a pioneer of the web because it produced the first widely popular internet application, Netscape Navigator. That was in 1994. We probably remember that. Um, the browser was a huge success thanks to its uh, point and click interface and it had some really good security in it. Uh, it also pioneered the uh, SSL protocol, which is the secure sockets layer, which is why its security was so good. Then we had a shift. Um, we went into what's called Web 2.0 and that first came into use in 1999 as the internet actually pivoted toward a system that more actively engaged with the users, right? Users were encouraged to provide content rather than just viewing or surfing uh, in a way. Now, Web 2.0 doesn't really refer to any specific technical upgrade to the internet. It simply refers to a shift. It's a mark in time, so to speak, in the way that we used uh, the internet and went into the 21st century and it reflects higher levels of information sharing and interconnectedness and such. Now, Archie uh, was the first internet search engine. Big stuff, hot stuff, right? That was released in 1990 and it actually indexed FTP archives which allowed users to search for uh, specific files. Uh, the search engine's landing page was rather simple. It had only a few uh, search parameters 
And when users logged on, all they saw was a text-based page. It did not recognize uh, natural language requests or index the uh, content inside files. Instead, users had to download the files to see if they were actually what they were looking for, you know, to get a peek at them. Now, we also had uh, Alta Vista that popped up, and that was the first searchable full text database on the World Wide Web, right? And it had a rather simple interface. It was popular um, because it had a vast index, very fast search results, and powerful search capabilities. It was also known. Uh, well, it was actually the, also the first known search engine to uh, launch image, audio, and video search uh, capability. Now, as of 1998, it used like 20 multiprocessor machines using 64-bit processors, and together, the back-end machines had 130 gig of RAM and 500 gig of hard disk drive, and it got about 13 million uh, uh, requests or queries a day. Uh, Alta Vista was uh, actually purchased by Yahoo in 2003. Now, before that happened, the Google search engine created by students at Stanford University was launched, and it was launched on first initially on Stanford University's private network, and this is in 1996. Um, piece of trivia for you here. It was actually called Backrub <laughs> because of how it used uh, web backlinks in, in the web, right? And now Google, the word Google is a rather creative spelling of a real word, world, a rear, <laughs> a real world word called Google, which is G-O-O-G-O-L. And that is simply a term that is uh, a mathematical term that denotes the number one followed by 100 zeros. So yeah, that's a, that's a pretty big number. Now Google, uh, the company was founded in 1998, but before that, the biggest search engine was, uh, was Yahoo, which was founded in 1994 and it was actually based on a directory of websites. Now, other popular search engines before Google hit the road uh, included, uh, you know, Alta Vista, which we mentioned, Excite, Lycos, InfoSync, those, those ones. Um, moving with the times, social media then, uh, these platforms uh, now popped up. They transformed the way that we connect and shared information like Facebook, which was founded in 2004, it was originally called thefacebook.com, and it was originally intended to be a directory of information for college students. Twitter popped up in uh, March of 2006, originally created as a platform for SMS-based communication. It was established as a platform for users to send text messages having a max limit of 140 characters. We also saw the rise of LinkedIn, which is uh, officially launched in 2003. Um, it's a business and employment focused social media platform. It works on websites, mobile apps, right, through your computer. Now, the e-commerce revolution was hot to trot at the time and it was led by uh, uh, companies too. Uh, Amazon, founded in 1994. Uh, the, that company was originally named uh, Kadabra, and I guess it's because it was magic, I, I don't know, and it started as an online marketplace for books. eBay also popped up, it, it launched in 1995, it was one of the first companies to create and market a website, right, an internet website that would match buyers and sellers of various goods and services, and these companies and companies like these that emerged later changed the way that we shopped and did business and it continues to that uh, same thing today. And every day that goes by adds to the history as we develop uh, and move into the future of the internet. And the trends currently at the heap, or the top, or the top of the heap, <laughs> um, 
We've got artificial intelligence and machine learning that drive advancements in areas like natural language processing and predictive uh, analytics. Uh, we have the Internet of Things that connects devices and homes and cities at an incredible rate. And these connections create new opportunities for automation, efficiency, and help us to escape the uh, uh, mundane tasks that humans get involved with. We've got blockchain technology and decentralized networks that are redefining security and privacy and uh, trust online. And of course, there are things that are needed for a company, and all of these are them to be sure, but there are certain things needed for a company to dominate the internet of the future, right? To be in a position of domination as we move into it. And as we list some of these out, keep in mind that on passive is active in all of them, right? So we need to be doing uh, investment in AI and machine learning research and development. We need to develop innovative IoT solutions and integrate those things with our existing infrastructure. We should be embracing blockchain and distributed ledger uh, technologies for uh, secure, transparent uh, transactions. And we need to foster a culture of data-driven decision-making and user-centric, right, human-centric design. And last but not least, we need to stay rather agile and adapt to the emerging trends uh, and regulations and such that we know that are coming out. Uh, I mean, the bottom line is that the Internet has come a long way since its inception. And the future, I think, is more exciting than ever. Companies that prioritize innovation, collaboration, and user experience are going to be poised to dominate the Internet landscape of tomorrow, right? The Internet of the future as we move into it. And as we continue to push the boundaries of what's possible online, we've also got to ensure that the Internet remains a force for good, accessible, and beneficial to all. And I have no doubt that on passive is well on the mark. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this, and I will look forward to speaking with you again. And please, if you're not a member yet, or if you're just curious, click on the link in the description box below, or click on the QR code here on the page. Uh, check out on Passive.com's site with the, the ecosystem as well. Uh, see some of the digital products, download some free stuff, get some, you know, go just go check us out. Thank you.